her with a disciple can personality but he has done some really big things in this market in marketing uh, he is a father of many children he's going to tell us how many Rogers, one of the things we do at uh, the fat talk is we usually get a lie one lie from from our speaker and one truth you don't tell us which one is the lie and which one is the truth or you can make them two truths and one lie or the other way around so you're going to think about three things you're going to tell us and our audience is going to take a poll uh, in choosing which they think is true and which they think is not true usually pick up the craziest things you think we do not know about you that would be exciting so mr rogers calling on guzu um is in the house everybody uh do you think you want to share the, them now or later uh, let me let me let me think through and then i'll share in a bit okay mm. are we ready we're ready ah we're ready Jesus. okay hey we're live Now we're starting for real. Just a second. Put your profile for me there. Okay. Which one? So, um, in the house today, we have the Fidelis Leadership Institute and Smart24 bringing to you a talk that we call Faithful, Available, and Teachable. We call them Fat Talks. And these fat talks are a product of the institute because the institute aims at growing um, ethical leadership in Africa. Um, in Africa today, we have everything we need under the ground. We have the minerals that are being discovered every day. We have bauxite, we have gold, we have uh, everything that we need, even for a nuclear war, I'm sure. Uh, when you come to the rivers, the lakes, the, the, the hills, the topography, we have all the beauty, but we also have all the things that we need uh, to succeed agricultural, uh, agriculturally and to actually be able to meet the food needs of the planet. As a continent, we have the youngest population on Earth with a population averaging at 15 almost. Uh, 50, uh, almost 50% of our population average is at 15. We have um, an amazing people. Uh, long ago, they used to, I think you've seen pictures in, in Europe and Asia and other countries where they would pick Africans and, and, and bring them and show them off because of their new bio strength, because of their beauty, because of their uniqueness, their height. And one of the things that we, is, is very disturbing is that with all these resources, with all this, we still have been, uh, we've been unable to move away from the developing country stage. So what is wrong? In the 60s, the Asian Tigers were at the same level as African countries. We had Singapore in 1963 at the same economic level as Uganda. Right now, they're in the first world, we're in the third world. What is wrong? When we look at Dubai, it's just a piece of stone, but it's so successful right now. Why is it doing better than, for instance, Uganda, the land of milk and honey? I would say, I would like to opine that for a long time, much as we've had uh, all the factors of production and even with development, all the foreign direct investment that is happening around the world is focused on Africa. So we have capital, we have labor, we have land, we have uh, a great human resource, we have all the natural resources that we need, we have great climate, but what has been failing us is leadership. And I want to say that uh, leadership is indeed a factor of production. That's why at the Fidelity Leadership Institute, we think that one of the ways in which to deal with corruption, with the Malays that's on the African continent, is to develop thought leadership around ethical leadership, around ethical values. And these values are to be faithful to your mandate as a leader, to be available to those that need you, the least of my brothers, but also to be teachable in your reputation. So as the Institute, we partner with strategic partners who we believe have a beautiful vision for Africa. So our latest addition is the Smart24 TV. 
which is uh, a, a, a television that's all over uh, East Africa and today they're partnering with the Fidelis Leadership Institute and we'll be doing more, many more exciting things and want to thank them, want to thank Mr. Naveta for this uh, partnership and our, our goal really is to do many things. We do trainings, we do uh, capacity building, we even have a leadership fellowship and we have exciting partnerships coming up for those that study at our institute. But I'm very excited to say that Fat Talks is one of our more exciting products because we look for people that are ethical, people that have made it. We want to encourage the child, the young person out there, we want to encourage the adult, the big person out there who's struggling to make it, that you can make it, and that you can make it as an ethical human being with values. You have to stand for something and not just fall for anything. However, in this realistic world, I keep being told to be real. Now I'm being real. We are told that it's only the wicked that prosper. And we want to say at the Fidelis Leadership Institute, we believe otherwise. We think that for Singapore to get where they were, somebody had to mean what they said. Somebody had to be accountable. Somebody had to care about the well-being of the people. For Dubai to be where it is, somebody had to come down and put the people first. And therefore, we are now using the Fat Talks to look for ethical leaders to encourage you that you too can make it. So today's conversation is about success. People say that there are three things that will destroy a man. Power, sex, love. But we know that for leaders, the anathema is power. So everybody has prepared us to work hard and get where we're supposed to be, but nobody has prepared us to handle the power, to handle success. When power happens to you, what happens? So today in our studio, in our Twitter space, we have with us a man that I've known for many years. He has a, a huge marketing experience over 20 years in marketing. He has been in all the big brands you can think of, MTN Uganda, Vision Group. He has been um, all the way from the graphics and the technology up to marketing, up to becoming a chartered marketer. Uh, he has been making brands happen. We know all the products that MTN has in, that, that he marketed. We also know all the products. He's running, I don't know, 20 stations right now. Uh, that's amazing. This is Mr. Rogers Anduzu, a good friend, and I'll declare uh, that he's somebody I admire career-wise and one of the things I like about him is you don't see him coming. So let's hear from him. He's been, he's been there, he's seen it all. But he's one of the humblest people we've seen. He's one of the most ethical people. We believe that the FLI belongs to this fat talk. Rogers, you're very welcome. Thank you, Fiona. Um, glad to be here. Um, honored that you guys at uh, Fidelity Leadership Institute find me uh, uh, worthy to come and speak at this uh, Fat Talks. Yes. So Rogers, um, tell us about you. Who are you? I, I, I've described you a bit emotionally because you're also a personal friend. I'd like you to just tell us what are you doing? Who are you at this point? Um, how would you like us to define all the many things you're doing? Just give us a snapshot. Okay. Um, I'm uh, Roger Zanguzu. I am a marketer with an IT background. Right now, I work with uh, Vision Group as head of marketing and communications. I'm a family man. Um, I am married with uh, five sons. Wow. I, I enjoy spending time with uh, family, leisure. I enjoy playing a uh, game of golf or just walking in the wild and with my headphones on, listening to music. I, yeah, I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's it about me, I think. So was Rogers always um, 
was was Rogers always the man that's making it? I mean, when you tell us you enjoy a game of golf, we're all like, wow, want to be there one day. Who was Rogers? Let's say five year old Rogers. Describe him for us. Okay, I was born in um, Arua. Arua is uh, up northwest of uh, Uganda to the late Alex Alia and uh, uh, Winnie Alia. They were typical civil servants. Yeah. They, we lived in the senior quarters and uh, we, I went to Arua Hill Primary School, then went to St. Joseph's College Ombachi for my O level, then I went to Busoka College Mwiri for my A level, then I went to university. You're describing like completely differently, like culturally different places. How was maybe the, the move from Ombachi to, uh, to Mwiri? And, and um, Ombachi was the school uh, back in the north, right? It still is in many ways. Um, and you said something about civil servants. What exactly were your parents doing? And how was that move from... Were you, were you staying in Arua then? Uh, at what point did you move to the city? I'm interested in seeing how that change might have impacted who you are now. Okay, um, I grew up in a big household. My mom initially uh, worked in Kampala, then uh, my dad worked in Arua, then my mom moved to join my dad, then all of us moved to Arua. Uh, then, from our early primary, P1 uh, onwards, we were in Arua, the whole family. I come from a large family. Uh, we used to be uh, eight, uh, nine, plus a half-brother. Then I lost my follower, my brother, in 2017. So we grew up in Arua most of the primary uh, up to when I was in S2, then my mom was moved back to Kampala. My dad was an accountant with the local government, then my mom was uh, an administrator. Then she moved to Kampala and uh, part of the family moved and then we would crisscross in between okay. holidays, we would sometimes be in Kampala, then uh, uh, study time, those who were studying in Arua. Then when I went to S4, there was a debate in the house. My dad wanted me to go to Nabmali because that's where he went. My mom wanted me to go to Busoga College Mwiri because her best friend's <laughs> husband was the head, headmaster. So uh, eventually I liked Mwiri and my mom won. So. Well, in that time, it wasn't easy to have a choice like Mwiri or Nabmali. You must have been quite the... The performer at school, how was that? How was school for you? Were you performing well? Uh, who would you credit that to? Was it either parental guidance, uh, fear of caning, or...? <laughs> um, I must say I was performing decently all right. Um, I used to pass my exams and, you know, get promoted. I think a lot of it was uh, from the family culture. So my dad had uh, celebrations for good performance. Oh, wow. Yes, so there was the law at home that when you pass uh, single digit numbers nine below, yes. you will get uh, chicken slaughtered in your name, then you get <laughs> taken out. And of course, everyone would eat, but you would then have the bragging rights to assure everyone that, you know, you're eating my chicken. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so that kind of pushed us. And my mom and dad were uh, educated. So they kept, you know, guiding us uh, on and on. And um, So in all this, who was Rogers in this crowd of eight? seven children. Were you naughty? Were you nice? Were you quiet? Were you loud? Uh, what was one of the naughtiest things you remember doing in that period? Um, I think I was two things. Uh, one, uh, as the firstborn, responsibility like got thrown at me very early so I had to, you know, lead the park and be the link between my parents and them. If my parents want to pass a very bad idea, then they have first convinced me and I go back to, to the others. However, 
I was told by my teacher in P7 that I was cheeky. It still hurts me up to today <laughs> that I got called cheeky. Um, yeah, I, the naughtiest thing I did, I remember uh, in Arua it was popular to have new clothes bought for you for Christmas and shoes and things. So one Christmas they couldn't find the, 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 my uh, shoe size in butter and my dad came home empty-handed. So I wow. got mad and I cried. I went, climbed the tree and I, <laughs> I was climbing up, crying from the tree and refused to come down. <laughs> so my dad had to go with uh, one of my siblings to butter, bought me, I don't know, butter or somewhere, bought me shoes. And then when I saw them under the tree, the tree and I came down. Came down. <laughs> well, uh, would you say this um, determination to get this determination to get your way has stuck with you. Would you say that? Is that something you are? Yeah, I think uh, uh, now thinking about it, I, I, I think when I want something, I'll do everything and go out and get it. But also, what I want always has to be guided by my values and not, not just anything and I go chasing anything. So, yeah. So you have what we call a guided ambition. Do you still throw tantrums to get what you want? Uh, being a married man, I've realized many times it doesn't work. My wife now, I think, is used to them. So <laughs> when I throw tantrums, she will just let me be and I come around when I need something. <laughs> that is so funny. Uh, so in the workplace, how would you throw the tantrum that gets Rogers what he wants? The workplace is quite different. Um, I think I just speak up and, you know, I tell them what I feel. I once said something to one of my bosses and then she looked at me and asked me, is that what you said? Then I had to explain and kind of sugarcoat it, but that's who I am. I, if I believe something is going to advance the organization and you're not listening, sometimes I lose it and say it in your face. And mm. So, one of the things that I know about you is that you are a very hard worker. Um, would you say success has happened just because of hard work or do you have to plan for it? Do you have to be intentional about going towards it? Uh, moving from one job to another, for instance. Um, negotiating. Yes, that's something we women always want to learn from men. In the corporate world, how do you negotiate um, better benefits or bet, uh, better pay if you're performing, for instance? Two, how do you tell when to move? Because you've moved jobs before, and you're one of the most loyal people I've ever seen. Because I think you were in a Vision Group for 15 years, something. Yes, before you about ever moved. Uh, yes. Yes, that, from um, right from school. Yes. So, so just give us a picture of what that looks like. Okay. Um, success. I first want to put a disclaimer. I'm not yet successful, but I'm working towards getting there. That's how ambitious you are. Um, <laughs> I think uh, success is a combination of very many yeah. uh, factors. Uh, for me, uh, from where I see it, the way I see it. One, of course you have to work hard. You have to work really, really hard. Two, success also comes uh, when, when there are hands that pull you up. There are always hands. Uh, um, even the Bible says, uh, who has spoken for you. Yeah. yeah, so there needs to be people that believe in your cause. I've been fortunate enough. Uh, I didn't even think I would be, I would grow into marketing. Mm -hmm. I always want to be a computer geek and seated right behind machines and not interfacing with uh, people. But one of my supervisors many years ago, uh, I had never even met him. He used to visit, come from South Africa, come here, and then uh, he had a problem that uh, a client had, and he asked around. People told him I would solve it. When I came, I solved it, and he was so amazed from that day on. He then pushed me and pushed me. He's still my referee up to now, Mr. Tony Glencross, and 
he pushed me into marketing. Then I had to go and do uh, a study with the Chartered Institute of Marketing and things like that. And it took me places. So then I met others along the way. So it's always been uh, uh, hard work on the one side, then uh, people that believe in you on the other. Then above all, I think all these forces have been brought together by the grace of God. So there has to be a, also a higher power that shapes the inner you, the soul that you subscribe to. If you're Muslim, it comes to your faith. If you're Christian, it has to be God. And whatever uh, supernatural uh, uh, thing that you believe in that shapes your inner self. Yeah. Because us as human beings, we would see the outer you. Uh, but what what uh, uh, you know? What uh, drives this outer you is something within you, yes. and that is shaped by the higher belief that you have inside you. That's interesting. interesting. Um, so, so you have to have a belief system. You have to have something to believe in. Yes, you definitely have to have something you believe in because then it's going to guide the things you can stand for or fall for and the then values. the values, yes. Mm. Then you asked about negotiation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, negotiation, I think it comes down to your value proposition. When you sit at a table and uh, someone tells you, I'm going to give you 1K. <laughs> Slow down. You're saying you have to have value for your offering. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, when you when you uh, you as a person you're bringing something to the table. I just yes. introduced myself as a, uh, a marketer with an IT background. Then there must be this person or this place that is looking for someone that fits those. I have been working for a while. I've uh, got some. Uh, some um, skills that I've acquired along the way experience and then I have read some books so I have something I'm bringing to the table now that value proposition you need to package it very well and you tell this person this is what I'm bringing mm -hmm. and then you translate that into what problems you're going to fix in the organization or what problems you're going to help them fix okay um I'm hearing many things here, Rogers. I'm hearing value proposition, I'm here, but you need to know your value. Yes. So you need to have first worked on your value really hard, uh, gotten that social capital to get you where you are, but then you get, then that catapults you into the boardroom. But you better know your value, know how to package it, and then um, be able to sell it. I think also being able to Selling is, uh, is a prerequisite from what I'm hearing. Absolutely. They are, it hurts sometimes. There are very uh, many people out there that are very good at what they do. They have a lot of, uh, you know, they are, this value they can bring to the table. But because they can't package it to convince the person at the other side of the table that yes. I can do this for you, then uh, uh, they, they get passed over. However, they, I mean, uh, they are. Uh, ways around that. Mm. I believe that's why insti institutes like Fidelis Leadership Institute exist to come and polish that up. You've gone to school, you've worked, you have this experience, but you always feel that <laughs> I'm being passed over for that uh, promotion. promotion. Then you come sit down and see how all this thing can be put together and solve a problem or uh, address some issues that the organizations are, are grappling with. Okay, um, so you have your boardroom, you're there, you're selling yourself. And now I'm speaking for some of the women in the room because we have been identified as people who don't always know how to negotiate well. Um, one of the things that uh, male employers sometimes presuppose is that uh, women will take a lower pay. Is that a presumption or is it that we undersell ourselves? As someone who's probably been on the other side of the hiring end, what would you say? I think I, uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, generally, there are people that, I mean, if you hear the talk around that, the lady's money is uh, her money, then the man looks after the family. <laughs> so I believe those come to uh, play a part as well. Uh, then also, I want to say generally that uh, uh, okay. I want to say generally that uh, 
it's a uh, it's a thing that the ladies do there are also ladies out there who i know that drive a hard bargain um so it's basically about looking at looking at both of them and uh getting a balance at that point um, it's true, there are some men who think a lady should be paid less because the man will look after the home. Mm -hmm. Yet, on the other side, there are also ladies that can drive a hard bargain. So, uh, what I would encourage all the ladies out there, you need to know your value, you need to... Because I've found uh, very smart women, very smart ladies. They are ladies I, 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 I look up to in marketing and in leadership, uh, who inspire me. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, when I was a young boy, I, I worked in Vision Group and Agi Konde, I was a brand manager and Agi Konde was, I think, head of marketing in uh, Monitor. Yes. Jeez, I used to <laughs> admire her. I, I always looked forward to that day when I would uh, work under her leadership and, you know, things like that. So, well, someone well, sent shouts out, out to Agi. Agi. One of one the... Of the uh, okay, let me mute. Uh. That's my speaker. Um, is it my so one of the one one of the things uh, that I'll look at now is the boy child. The boy child, while the while the girl child is underselling herself and really working hard and maybe bringing value to the table, but failing. To get what she deserves for it. This now I'm talking about uh, myths in the workplace. They aren't myths, but they're like um, things that everybody talks about. Trends, yes, trends. So indicative trends. The boy child, on the other hand, sells a good show. Like he really, really sells himself really well. Gets in the boardroom, gets the parks. Uh, but then sometimes is found wanting on performance. I think you must have come across uh, these statements. And as a result, I have a lot of boy children telling me, you know, the girls are taking all the jobs and everything. And this is because their competition works hard and takes less money. <laughs> and I'm all less. So what would you say to the boy child? How do you, once you have oversold yourself and you have succeeded, how do you manage that success? Um, I think, uh, let me start, let me take a step back. The boy child is really under threat. <laughs> uh, I say this because uh, sometime last year I, I went on, um, I was on um, uh, one of a panel of, uh, on a panel of judges for the total start, uh, start yeah. yeah. The... There were boys and there were girls that had ideas and they came and told us about their ideas. Jeez, you should have seen the girls. Wow, what happened? There was one lady on the panel and I think we were four men. We looked at the boys. Yeah, I, I think power got to our heads as boys and we started taking things for granted. The boys like had what? ideas like what I, and, like what and they would come and explain. Uh, some had... Uh, uh, solar panels made out of plastic and in form of a roof, uh, so a roof tile. Yeah. So you would use oh, wow. the roof tiles, and then inside is is embedded a, 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 a solar, solar panel. panel, and it you know Brilliant. made out of plastic. So they uh, burn mineral water bottles and reshape it. Then there were those that had um, um, someone was making, uh, I think bags out of plastic and they were brilliant ideas but the girl child would explain it and their ideas were so brilliant some of the boys had good ideas but they would not even bother to explain and they just felt like so yes that's why i say the boy child is under <laughs> threat and attack so they need to we need to wake up and get our acts together and uh, shoulder on um so what was your question again how do you manage when you've oversold yourself and into arrived, a position okay. and you've arrived? How do you? How would you advise the boy child or the girl child? In that case, the girl child who's learned to negotiate uh, to handle that. I think the first, uh, my first 
guidance would be just don't try to under, oversell yourself. Be truthful and sell what you can do. And uh, uh, that way, you will manage things better. But in the event that you're caught on the other side and you have oversold yourself, um, one, try to learn those skills that you don't have. Yeah. Surround yourself with the most intelligent people that can help you out of that ditch. Some people find those threatening. Trust me, when you have the best team and you are explaining things in the boardroom, no one will know that it's your team that did it. Yeah. But always bring that glory back to your team. I mean, there's no, there can only be one me. There can never be another person like me. <laughs> uh, yes, you can be better than me in an aspect, then another person in another aspect, but you can never be completely like me. Yeah. I am just one me and that's me. So I can never be scared or worried about someone. So I think everyone needs to develop that uh, feeling. I mean, at least you're good in something and another person will be better in another thing. So they cannot, it's not comparable. So just take what other people uh, can give you. Let's complement each other and you deliver. When you find yourself at the top, you're the leader. Just uh, make sure you deliver. If you oversold yourself, get the skills that can deliver for you and deliver. So, team dynamics. dynamics. Um, um, being Roger, being Roger amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Sorry, we're together, so the technology is being a bit funny. But, um, being Roger, you are quiet, so you're likely to be the guy in the team who probably works the hardest and probably gets the least credit. I'm talking for those people now. Uh, probably gets the least credit because maybe you are not um, out, outwardly shiny, um, what do you call it? You're not sanguine. You know what I mean? You're not, an, you're not an overt person who's going to sing their own praises. So if you are this person that is not overselling themselves, you're just working hard, and now we're dealing with the team dynamics of that, um, how do you get noticed? And I'm saying this because a lot of our listeners are lawyers, and I see some of them suffer that. Uh, you, you do all the work, and then senior counsel goes to court and shines. And sometimes she won't even share with you some of the money. What, how would you manage because that's a level of success that we're struggling with because you're likely to be the person who always strengthens this team leader but then when is it going to be your day uh, did you ever struggle with those kinds of things or um or if not what would what advice would you give to that person that is struggling in that way okay um yes i have been down that road uh yeah, um, you do all the donkey work, if I, if I may say, and someone else presents it. Um, I think it's... Uh, one thing I know is when you work hard, when you're consistent, and when you've uh, mastered your craft, yes. it will come out, it will show. You can never hide a light uh, uh, under the cup or something. <laughs> It will eventually show. Yeah. So to everyone out there that...